On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Stella. And Stella was in a crazy-making relationship with a smear-campaigning abuser. It's a story of being vouched for, isolation, infidelity, sowing the seeds of doubt, and financial abuse. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Stella. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing well, and thank you for being here with us today. And if you want to be a guest like Stella is today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. At the top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page, and there you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out a Guest Form and press the Submit button, and please do send it in the format that we ask for. So a content warning for this episode, we do discuss physical and sexual abuse on this episode, so a content warning there. This episode is on the shorter end and has been in our vault for a while. It has a lot of pops and whizzes from our original recording from electrical noises when recording, and we tried to clean them up as best for you as possible. It's short, this episode, but very compact and clear, and I think it will really validate the experiences of so many of you out there. So with that being said, I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Stella, the floor is now yours. Thank you for having me, and I'm a big fan of podcast and I follow your Instagram page. So I'm very appreciative of the information. I dealt with a lot of trauma from an early age and my father was addicted to drugs. He was very violent uh, verbally and physically. And my mother was just textbook codependent and uh, was very neat submissive uh she was really just a doormat and that was these were the two role models that I had you know growing up and he ended up abandoning the family when I was 15 and he his entire double life came out he married somebody within a very short period of time and had children and just started a whole new life. And I didn't realize at the time the profound impact that all of that had on me from the abuse to him leaving because I didn't grow up in a home where we talked about our feelings. I didn't go into therapy. My mom was an absolute mess after he left. And I just talked all my feelings away and just kept moving with life and I excelled in many in many aspects I would say like career I was always driven um I had an active social life but as far as relationships go and with men I was this was like my weak point and um I was just you know I, I had one boyfriend for eight years and it was Again, I was super codependent in that. And he was not, he was not abusive, but he was very much traumatized himself and was really emotionally shut down. And after that relationship ended and he ended on good terms, I was single for about four years and focusing on work. And and then around four to four and a half years later, I met my ex, and that's when my entire life shifted. So where did you end up meeting the person that the story is about? With Ashley, my sister married into a very wealthy 
a community, like a family that were, it's a country club community. And he was, my ex was in this community and he was a very successful uh, businessman and everybody in the community loved him. No, everybody had such good things to say. So I would say through, you know, my sister's marriage, I kind of entered this tight knit community as well. And that's how I, I met him. And everybody kept telling me he's the greatest guy. You have to give him a chance. And I listened to everybody else except for, you know, the alarms going off. A few times that I met him in a group setting, I found him very, like he was dominant. You know, he, he wanted, it was, it was obvious to me that he wanted the attention on him. And I, you know, I kept telling him, I'm not, I'm really not interested. But that was really the start of love bombing, which I didn't understand at the time. And it was very, very over the top, you know, the, the phone call, morning, noon, and night, nonstop text messages. He would drop off the, I mean, two to three hundred dollar bouquets that he would just leave in front of my, the building of my apartment. And he kept saying, all I wanted, all I want is love. I have, I've dated so many crazy, lying, cheating women. He had many, many exes that he very you know poorly about he would say that you know all of them lied they were all crazy and uh very much a victim you know i just i just want love like i have every other um you know parts of my life are checked off that's for the best and that's kind of like you know what it it worked on the hook line in Senka, and i was like you know what everybody's saying that he's a nice guy and you know what he he is a nice guy, even though it was oh very over the top. I mean, fancy dinners. Um, and then within what was it, two weeks, I think, he gave me a copy of his house keys, and he said, "Move in with me. Don't don't renew your lease. Move in with me." And I'm like, "What? We we just we just met a couple of weeks ago. This is this is crazy." But it was just so intense. I love you. I love you. You're my soulmate. I've never felt this way. I, I have to be with you. And I went totally unconscious, I think, at that time. And I was like, you know what? Let me take a chance. And, of course, my friends and, and family were like, you have to. He's a great guy. You can't miss this opportunity. And... I ended up not renewing my lease in my apartment and I moved in with him within the, within three months of him and I dating. So this is all happening really fast. You have classic love bombing here. He's being vouched for. And then usually the people who are supposed to stop you from jumping in so fast, the people that are supposed to be the, hey, what the heck are you doing type of people, but they're not saying, what are you doing? They're saying, this is a good idea. So what are they thinking and what do they like about him? He, he lost his mother to breast cancer five years prior. And that was part of his victim story. Um, with my friends and family, you know, he would say how devastated he was about losing his mother. And, you know, he, he was, he's extremely charming. I had never met anybody that charming ever. He could choose anybody. Um, and my friends really were, they were mesmerized by him. They're like, oh my God, he's such a nice guy. And, you know, he really likes you and he's, he's looking for everything you're looking for. He wants marriage. He wants kids. You know, you would have to be crazy to turn this down. And same thing with my mother. And again, I was hearing all of these things about him within the community that he's just the sweet guy he was running a few charities as well 
um, raising money for kids and for um, the, the country that he's from and sending back all of these things. So he looked really good on paper. So I, I bought into it. But what I did have was the minute he came into my life, I developed um, a crippling anxiety disorder, which I had never had. And it was like every time I was around him, I was telling my therapist at the time that I was panicking. Like I was waking up in the middle of the night hearing like, you know, run, danger, like these, it, it was, I can't describe it. it. It sounds like, you know, I can understand that it doesn't sound right, but panic attacks every time I was around him. And I think that my body was warning me, you're in trouble, but I misconstrued the anxiety at the time. I just thought it was from work. So I moved in around this three months mark around the time where I got the last bit of my stuff in his apartment, there was a big shift in him, which I didn't understand at the time. And that was the beginning. It was almost like, I mean, so many victims can say this, where you're just bombarded, bombarded by this love bombing that's so intense. And he wanted to get married right away and I just kept saying like we we have to hold off this is like I just moved in let's settle into this and then we'll take it how it goes I did want obviously to get married and have children that's always been part of my my life plan but it was just so so intense when I when I look back I'm I'm almost shocked that I didn't um, got myself at some point. And I felt like any time I tried to be firm with a boundary, he would just trample over me. And then the shift really started happening around, I would say the four months mark, or yeah, maybe four months then. And it was almost like a light switch went off. He was he seemed disinterested. I kept feeling like he was seeing other women. There were some things with expenses that he was being very secretive about. And at the time, I didn't know that he was in debt. And I didn't actually know at the time that he had a girlfriend that he was with. Um, this all came out much later. Um, he started, you know, you're, you're crazy. That was one of the first things I remember that he kept saying, you're, you're crazy. You need medication. You're bipolar. Um, you don't know how to love, me. you don't know how to love anybody. Um, you don't know the first thing about a healthy relationship. This was sort of what he kept saying multiple times a day. And when you start, when you're being told that you're crazy <laughs> over and over again, you start to really feel like you're losing your mind. And all of a sudden, I no longer had a job. He wanted me at home. This was his plan, I think, obviously, to isolate me. And he kept saying, you're so stressed out with work. You're so stressed out. You should just stay at home. I'm making more than enough money. And I loved my job. I loved I enjoyed working. I always loved having a career. And I I basically quit my job and I was at home. And my role was cooking, cleaning, doing all the paperwork, paying the bills, taking care of his dog. And he was just out and about all the time. And if I asked questions or, you know, questioned his whereabouts, he would go into rage, which I didn't understand at the time. And the most intense thing that he did was the gaslighting. He would hide my belongings 
and get rid of my clothes and tell me that I'm losing it. You're losing your mind. You can't remember anything. He suddenly had issues with everybody in my life, friends, family, um, you know, your mother's abusive. Your friend is not, you know, they're not looking out for your best interest. You're so lucky you have me. And it was just complete, complete chaos. I mean, a year and a half in, I was a shell of the woman that I used to be. I physically, I looked ill and my mental health was really, really declining. So within the first year and a half, you're being gaslit about your mental health, which then starts to become a thing that you start to question. It creates doubt about what you think and do. You think you might be going crazy or it makes you feel like you are going crazy. He has you quit your job. So now there's this financial abuse and isolation. He's doing whatever he wants. You are attending to the house. You aren't allowed to discuss things. There is a rage that might happen if you do attempt to discuss things so he's instilling fear in you Uh, then he further isolates you by saying these things about your friends and family he becomes this truth teller in your life and he's just controlling it and your body is feeling the abuse so with all that being rounded up there are there other things that he was hiding that are starting to show up now at this point he had all sorts of addiction which I didn't, you know, which were slowly coming out, like with the video games. I mean, he would be playing till three o'clock in the morning, pornography addiction, food addiction, you know, he would, he would use, he was binging. I mean, it was obvious. And every single aspect, every part of my life was deteriorating. My finances, because although he was making, he made quite a lot of money, he lived this very grandiose lifestyle like he you know he didn't budget and he would just spend and spend and spend so no matter how much you make if you're living like that you know you're gonna run out of money at some point and I mean the cheating was becoming more and more apparent he would hit me in my sleep and then if I woke up saying like I think you just smacked me he would just say oh you're crazy you're bipolar, you need medication. So it was just, I mean, everything flipped upside down. So a physical abuse is coming into play here, which is very difficult for you to discern as you're sleeping when it happens, and then you get gaslit about it, which adds to the crazy making. So what else is going on in the house that you can identify as abuse either at the time or in in hindsight? He was very, very covert. There, it was like these things needed to be done. And if they weren't, it's not that he would come home and like scream and throw things around the house, but it was very like passive aggressive. Like he would walk to the kitchen counter and like wipe his finger on it. And if there was like crumbs or dust, he would just give me like a death stare from across the room. And I very much went into a like a very young part of myself in this relationship. I was an adult me in it. I completely reverted back to my childhood and the whole dynamic of like my abusive father and me being a little girl, it was just playing out again in, in present day. That's what was happening. And I had just, you know, my, my anxiety disorder was debilitating at that point. I, I didn't know what was wrong with me. And, um, you know, he would come, I, I couldn't ask questions. He would come home when he came home. And at this point, he had started smear campaigning me already, but I didn't know what that was. We would go out and I would get like death stares from his friends. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what's up with so-and-so. And he would say, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I, I keep telling them you're great, but they just, like, they have an opinion of you. They just don't like you. And he was triangulating me with his 
his father and his brother. I later found out that he would film me while I was sleeping and he would send videos to his friends and family saying like, oh my God, he's drunk again. Here she goes again, the alcoholic. And I mean, just crazy stuff. And you can't explain it to somebody that has not experienced this type of person. Like only survivors really get it. And if, when I try to explain to other people, I'm like, oh yeah, he was recording me and he would say that I was drunk. They're like, wait, what? Like who, who would do that? That doesn't make any sense. But they are, he was extremely, extremely covert. And his, his, uh, the facade of his, his persona of being this great guy in the community. I mean, he really, he shined in public, but behind closed doors, it was being a whole different person. And his complete lack of empathy was becoming more and more apparent. He had a dog. He wouldn't walk the dog. It was just what he wanted to do. And everybody else came last. It was always him being, you know, his plans and his dreams and his wishes. Everything was on the forefront. And um, and he had a sex addiction, which came out much later. <laughs> So you're dealing with all this and feeling crazy. He's he's literally driving you crazy with the abuse in gas lighting. Are you voicing this to someone? Are you reaching out for support in, in any way? I kept it all to myself. I I I internalized I think so much of, of his shame and again like the shame from my childhood. I completely kept up a front I mean nobody knew and at that point I wasn't seeing I wasn't really seeing anybody I was completely isolated uh I would talk to my mom maybe once every two weeks but no I pretended like everything was fine and um that we were happy and uh no I kept it completely to myself because he made me feel like it was me. He made me feel like I was a problem in the relationship and that I should be so lucky to be with a guy like him that he's giving me the time of day. I mean, you know, it takes, they break you down slowly and you get to a point where you're just like flailing and you're like, okay, you know, on an eggshell environment, I can't, can't upset him. I don't want to upset him. And He's the right. I am so lucky to have him. Otherwise, I'll be alone. And obviously, no one's going to want me. And he's telling me what a horrible person I am. And, you know, he would pull apart my appearance. And his ex girlfriend was this. And his ex girlfriends were that. And the constant uh, triangulation. And then he let it slip. And he said, I left, you know, I left somebody for you. So you better behave type of thing and I was like wait what you you had a girlfriend I was com- I was absolutely floored and he's still out he was surrounded by a nape but we're just agreeing with his behavior and everything yeah it was a lot to handle at the time so at around the two-year mark I started to realize I was in trouble he was getting as time went by he was getting he was becoming more and more abusive it was going from covert behavior to just right in your face with the the raging and uh at that point i think he started pushing me and uh the cheating his affairs were becoming more and more obvious to a point where he he couldn't really hide it anymore and i had a breakthrough moment So I went back into therapy. And the reason I went back was I was like, I need a therapist to help me love him better because I'm, I'm just destroying this relationship. How much my head was underwater. I got really lucky with the therapist and we had about six sessions and she finally said, Hey, do you think I can do a session with him or maybe a couple session? And I'm like, no, he's, he's never going to agree to that. And he surprisingly did. 
And throughout this session, of course, he's sitting there masked on. He's talking about all of his accomplishments. And we left the therapy session. And then about years later, he sent me an email. And she said, we, we need to talk. I have to speak with you. It's important. And when I called her back, I said, you know, what's up? And she said, you had described him to me a lot different when we first had our the six sessions below. And you had described him as loving and kind. And you made, your, and you made it seem like you were the problem in this dynamic. And she said, I think your anxiety and, and what you're feeling is trying to to you she said I did not get a good vibe from him and I think that you might be in an abusive relationship and when she said that it was like I broke through the gaslighting it was like the glass just shattered because I went oh my god someone is seeing it on the outside and that's when I started to I started to stand my ground. I was talking back to him. And I started to slowly work on an exit strategy. Because I always tell people they're like an octopus. Their tentacles wrap around all aspects of your life. They bind you to them to make it more challenging for you to leave. Because now I didn't have a job. I was dependent on him for money. He had, we were in debt at that point. Um, We had the cards together and I had no place to live because I had ended my lease um, two years prior. I just knew, I was like, I have to get out of here. So in the middle of the abuse, which was so intense at that point, voicing that I'm going to leave was when I look back in hindsight and for other survivors as well and victims, Don't ever tell them that you're leaving because that's when he really started amping up the abuse and making it more challenging for me. So I had a lot of obstacles in my way, but I just kept, I kept holding on. And I said, in six months, I've got to get out of here. So eventually you do leave six months after this and you find out amongst other things that he's been having affairs. You also find out that he was engaged three months prior to you two meeting and that he was always working on a smear campaign behind the scenes. And this was going on for a very long time, the smear campaign building. So walk us through this. He had been working on the smear campaign for a long time. So by the time I left, the entire community had turned their backs on me. Um, So that was really hard because I had no support system at that point. And the people that I thought were, quote unquote, my friends clearly were not. And he was, you know, his behavior was, he was vindictive and I pretty much left without any of my belongings, like not even my clothes. I left everything in the apartment. It was really intense trying to get out of there. So <laughs> three days after I left, he announced on Instagram that he was engaged. He moved the woman that he was cheating on me with into the home within days. He had a child, I think, nine months later. So it was mind-blowing to me at the time because I had, for six months, I was just focused on, you know, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. And I didn't realize, I don't think you see the damage that they've inflicted until you're physically away from them. So it was trying to come to terms with the fact that I was in this very abusive relationship and now here he is, double life, and living in the home that I was, you know, living in with some other woman and started a completely new life. So it was, I was really messed up for about a year, I would say. 
where I, I, I could not function. It was really, really bad. After a year, I was like, I, I've got to get on my two feet again. I can't keep living like this. And I did have support. My mother, of course, stepped up to the plate. My sister, I, a few friends did connect with me again after I explained what was actually happening. So I went into therapy twice a week and I was, again, it was with that great therapist that helped me see the light and it was a lot of work. So, so much work. I would do the homework that she would give me, you know, breaking that trauma bond is no joke. I mean, I was addicted to this person, even though you know, for six months, I was like, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. You start missing them. I started questioning myself. I'm like, oh my God, he's in this late. He's married. He has kids. Like, oh, it had, it, it was me. Like, you know, I messed this up and all of the thoughts that go through your head. But, you know, with therapy, I started exercising, which helped a lot. I had super busy. I started a business. So I think that was a blessing for me, just staying so busy. And I was determined to heal from this. I did not want this chapter of my life to define who I was and dictate the rest of my life. And the the business ended up taking off. And then I started another business. And it was a lot of work. And I started gaining my confidence back, you know, with real work. And it was so hard for me to socialize, but I committed to like a class a week. I would go in this city and like, like a yoga class. And, you know, I couldn't trust anybody and I didn't want to be around people. But the more that I stepped out of the fear, there was a shift, like the old me was coming back. And I always tell, you know, when I've spoken to other victims that I've been through this, is like, you're not going to heal from watching their lives blow up or seeing their next relationship fall apart. And of course, there's so much injustice involved in these relationships because we seemingly watch them just walk away from all of this carnage and just move on with their lives and start a whole new and exciting chapter but you have to focus on yourself as hard as that is and you just have to work on shifting the focus from them to your life and bettering yourself and and we all know that happy content people do not go around harming others or messing up someone's psyche on their way out So uh, from what you wrote me, inner child work and therapy really helped you out a lot. And not just your psyche, but understanding his too. And it's not a fix or help for everyone, but for you, it helped a lot. So tell us about this. Once I started to really feel that little person inside of me, I, the power that my act had over me started falling away I was like oh okay this is just a little person who's dysfunctional and he feels out of control and he feels so much shame and he has to you know attempt to dump that onto other people and it's his stuff and I just slowly just started handing that back to him like no this is you and you know we you take you with you wherever you go so for all of the victims out there, it's, I know how painful it is to see them just jump into another relationship and they move on like you never had anything or you didn't matter to them. But just please know that you take yourself with you. It's the same person in, in a different but yet similar dynamic. And, um, yeah, it, this is, uh, do I wish I got the lesson in another way? Absolutely. But this is the path of my, this is the journey that I'm supposed to be on. 
and Stella, if you have any words of wisdom, what would they be? There's no quick fix. And we're all, we all have, I think depending on the amount of trauma that you also have prior to these relationships, it takes time to heal. So you can't, you can't rush it. And um, that's like the biggest hook for victims, I would say, is like, are they going to treat the new supply better? No. <laughs> it's the same, it is the same person unless they've committed to intense, intense therapy. And then even then, there's no guarantee. And the justice is you moving on with your life and healing. Seeing you happy, being happy and being content is the biggest way I think to get back at them because that's the last thing that they want is to see you move on and live a fulfilling life and healing healing my codependency was also huge I joined a, it was a free support group Pia Melody's book uh, Codependent No More was huge for me in my healing process well, Stella, thank you for being here and sharing your story. You did a great job of clearly showing some textbook abuse and validating so many people's experiences and also some small nuances for people that they might be going through, especially the physical abuse while sleeping. I'm sure many people out there are going through that and it's making them feel crazy, just like you were feeling crazy being gaslit. So a big, big thank you for being here and sharing your story and validating validating everyone's experiences and just being here with us today. You did it. You just did a great job and I can't thank you enough for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So Stella, thank you once again for being here with us today. And if you want to be a guest like Stella was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page, and there you can read all of our instructions, and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com, or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button, and please do send it in the format that we ask for. And if you are someone that needs support, we here at Narcissist Apocalypse have a support group. So at NarcissistApocalypse.com, top of the page, there's a button that says support group. And when you click on that button, it takes you to our very own safe social network. And inside, you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday nights, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We also have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation that you need from survivors just like you. It is a wonderful group of people on there, and you can share your experiences and make friends as well. So if you need support, join our support group today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. At DomesticShelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you're dealing with. They have every phone number and email address and web address for shelters and agencies, no matter how big or small the town you are in. DomesticShelters.org has it there. It is a wonderful free resource and organization. So if you need extra support, please do go to DomesticShelters.org. And we are also friends with a place called Shelter Movers, and Shelter Movers can be found at sheltermovers.com. And Shelter Movers helps survivors of domestic violence transition to a better and safer life. It is a volunteer organization, a donor-supported charitable organization as well. And what they do is they help coordinate moves for people who are getting out of domestic violence. They help you to safety, and they get all of your things out of your home and into storage all of your belongings into storage and they can do this for your pets and livestock too. It is a wonderful organization. So if you need help from them or just want to donate to them, please go to sheltermovers.com and they are currently only available in Canada, but they are trying to get into the United States eventually. And that is it for our episode today, our survivor story. So for myself and Stella, we hope you have a good night.